Okay, yeah, we'll watch it out, okay? <laughs> <laughs> if they do anything, tell me. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight. This is the uh, Century 17th book. Uh, how many of you all have already read the book? Okay, a, a few. When we get to the Q&A portion of the evening, just, just, just a, a request. Um, be very careful in what you ask so that the spoiler alert, right, so you don't give anything away. Now I have another question for you. I question my audiences. If that's what we do. Uh, how many of you guys are on Facebook? <laughs> the movie was right. It's, it's like billions of you. I was one of those people who, who always disdained. You know, I had my website, and then my, and, and through my website, people could write to me, and I got a lot of mail from people, and I had a newsletter. So I had my, my little corner of the Internet staked out. So I was the guy who made fun of Facebook, you know, with all friends, people you never met. They're, you know, they, 3,000 friends, they come over for dinner. Who are they? <laughs> um, but, and my publishers, the last few years, have always hammered me about getting on Facebook. They would say, oh, look, everybody's migrating to Facebook from where? But everybody's migrating to Facebook, getting on Facebook. And I would say, no, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. About three months ago, um, my new publisher, Putnam, they made me an offer I couldn't refuse. They said, <laughs> they said we'll do it for you. <laughs> and, and they said, you mean like you'll do everything? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. we'll just be you. So you we, we, we want you to be on Facebook so badly, we'll just be on Facebook for you. We have Robert Craig's Facebook page. So I said, sounds good. If I convince them to write my book, but no, I would never do that. So now we get through, we get involved in this, and they're building this Facebook page for me. But then, being me, I start to get nervous because you know they're going to go out and pretend to be me, which makes I don't I'm uncomfortable with that now. And so I'm looking over their shoulder because I don't want them to do or say anything that you know I don't approve of. Uh, and we're not yet live; it's called going live. And I'm on the phone in L.A. from my office, and they're in New York, and they're on the phone, and they're, they're building this. Finally, we get ready for launch day. It's like, I don't know, like Cape Canaveral, because it's that morning, and I've got the, the phone, and, and I'm looking at it, right? I'm looking at it on my computer. No one else can see it uh, except me and them. And they're looking at it in New York, and they say, okay, you ready to go? And I said, yeah. So they're like, five, four, three, two, one. And, she, and then the voice says, okay, we're live. I said, nothing happened. <laughs> and I said, well, okay, well, like, I hit refresh. So I hit the refresh button. I mean, oh, like, two, two people pop up. And I said, well, that wasn't much. And he said, well, just, well, yeah, well, and we're talking, we're killing time, about 90 seconds past, she says, hit refresh again. So I hit refresh again. And this time, like, like 15 or 20 people pop up, like, that fast. And I said, well, that's pretty cool. And so she said, well, I'll hit it again. So I hit it again, like another 20 people pop up. And now I've become that cliche. I check the damn thing 800 times a day. <laughs> it's, been, it's been three months, and like, you know, I'm me on Facebook. Like, they don't, they're not pretending to be me, but I'm just addicted to it. Uh, and, it's, and it's actually become an element in, in this tour for the century uh, be, for, for a couple of different reasons that I find amazing. Uh, when I was in... Uh, in week one of the, of the tour, the book came out a couple of weeks ago, I was in Seattle to do a, a, a book signing at a terrific general independent bookstore like, like this. And um, we got there, uh, that's not the royal we, the escort guy, there's two of us. And we got there like 25 minutes early, because we tried to get there early. And, and we're walking across this, it's a, it's a huge store in an open air mall. And we're walking across the parking lot, and there's this gigantic explosion. I mean, like a loud, it sounded like a plane crash. And all these people scattered around, all scream, and everybody, including us, would turn and look. And then there's a second explosion. And then what it is, you can see it across the highway in the trees, you know those huge power transformers that are up on? Two of them exploded. And when they exploded, the whole entire area went, went dark, which meant <clears throat> the bookstore and all the other shops, but the bookstore was, was, was dead in the water. Um, but about 15 or 20 people had come early and had already purchased books. Because as soon as the power was off, the registers are off, there's no credit card sales, and that's that. And also the booksellers, they wanted to close their, their store. But I just didn't want to ride off into the sunset because these people had driven a long way. So now uh, they set up a table for me, and I signed these people's books. There weren't many books to sign, but you know, I, I signed them. And with no lights, so the booksellers uh, found a couple of 
uh, flashlights, and they're holding them overhead. And then, like, all these people who are crowded around, they're holding up their cell phones, right? So we get the glow. And I see, like, a couple of flashes go off, and I know people are taking pictures of this thing. So by the time I got to the hotel that night, these things are already on the Facebook page. These, these people ran home, and they're actually posting the pictures of it. And that's happened at darn near every, every, yeah, every sign along the way. By the time I get back to the hotel, I check the, the page again for the 800th time that day. You know, there's new, new pictures. So I read all this stuff, and I look at it, and I'm fascinated because I notice in the three months we've been doing this now, now there's like 11,000 people on the thing. It grows by like 30, 40 people every day. Um, I can kind of divide my readers into three basic groups. It's my readers on Joe Pike, my readers on me, and, and general questions that, that are posted about things. Um, so, I'm, but these are all real. Right? Most of these come from Facebook. A couple are uh, emails that I've gotten. <clears throat> but here's, here's, here's a little glimpse into my life. Uh, my reader's on Joe Pike. I want, very much so, to run away with Pike and have his baby. <laughs> Here's another. Yeah. Here's another. I want Joe Pike. I want him to own me. Is this wrong? I want to have Joe's children. Can you send him my way? I also bake pies. I'm still thinking about that. She, I guess she figured she would cover all his needs. <laughs> Mr. Robert Crace, please forward this request for marriage to Joe Pike. If, if not him, Elvis Cole will do. <laughs> if not Mr. Cole, you. <laughs> Isn't that great? I mean, I'll tell you, actually, it, it, it is great. I mean, clearly, these, the, the people who post these, they know what they're doing, and, and they're having fun when, when, they, when they post this. And one of the things that I think is so great about it is, um, for me, what it suggests is they're doing this because they've invested so much in, into these characters. You know, they're, they're doing this because it's fun, because uh, they love Elvis Cole and they love Joe Pike. And that's why they've come to this page, and that's why they're having this fun, and that's why they're making these posts. Now, for, for a writer, um, you know, you write your book and you're alone and you send it out and you hope that people read it and that, and that somehow it touches them. You know, it isn't just something you read on the plane and leave, leave on a seat when you walk away, that somehow it, it touches your reader. And, uh, and I take this as an affirmation that, that it actually does. That's why people care because it's all about those characters. Um, sometimes my readers, however, get confused. <laughs> Dear Mr. Crace, I love your books and have read every one. I can't wait for the next one. You really have a good thing going with that, Jack Reacher. <laughs> now, I read that to Lee and he laughed too. Uh, not all of my readers uh, think highly of me. <clears throat> Am I missing a joke? What is your point in using the same first initial in several of your characters? Is this what they teach in writer's workshops? I find it so annoying that I returned your book for a refund. To wit, the first rule has Joe Pike, Jamal Johnson, John Stone, John Chen, Jameson Wallace. If you're having writer's blocks on names, let me know. I can think of at least a thousand. <laughs> and then he signs it, a former reader. <laughs> now just think, in all the things going on in the world, that's what pissed this guy off. <laughs> okay, so now, unlike that guy, pay attention to this next reader. This is one of my favorite readers. You'll learn something here. I am counting the minutes until the sentry shows up poof on my iPad. Now, I've already ordered the hardback for my library. Yes, I like you so much I buy two copies of each book. <laughs> Just saying. 
<laughs> Just saying. That's right. This is my favorite reader of all time. Dear Robert Crace, you are a god. <laughs> What'd your wife say? <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> You're funny. <laughs> My readers have questions. Is this going to be the book where Elvis and Joe finally kiss? <laughs> <laughs> you are smart, funny, and talented. Would you consider being a sperm donor? <laughs> I said, how much? <laughs> now that one my wife did not like. <laughs> I can't wait to see what people uh, post after they read the century. I just love this stuff. It's, it's like a glimpse into another world for me, but it's a good and positive world because I, it comes from a place where people have invested in these characters that I've spent the last 20-something years living with. Um, to that end, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read <clears throat> two... Um, two sections from the new, new book of the century before we do Q&As. And like I said earlier, uh, it's all about the characters. It's all about Elvis and Joe. And if you've read the, the, my work, and I'm sure most of you have, else you wouldn't be here, uh, you know that in the last few books, I've really been getting into Joe and exploring who Joe Pike is and, and kind of giving glimpses into, his, uh, into him why he is the way he is, you know, trying to get behind the sunglasses, as it were, and deep inside. Um, I think people read these books because of the friendship between Elvis and Joe, and also because of what defines these two men as, 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 as characters. Um, that's what I've been trying to get at, and uh, this book is no exception. It occurred to me that for as little as we know about Joe, and, and, and for as isolated as, as Joe keeps himself, uh, the human connection must be extremely important to him. <clears throat> Consider his friendship with Elvis Cole. Now, Joe is a guy who doesn't have a lot of friends, friends, but how important is this friendship with Elvis Cole? I mean, look how enduring it is. Look what these guys go through together. Uh, look how Joe is so protective of Elvis and has been over the course of all the books that I've written. Uh, I think that's a, a classic standard, you know, male-male friendship. I am certain, though he hasn't told me, but I am certain that there's got to be a part of Joe that wants, wants a, a woman. He, he wants something more. He wants that companionship, that someone to share those parts of his life that maybe he can't share with, with, with Elvis Cole. And that's kind of the way I came at this book. I wanted him, um, I wanted to create that moment where here's Joe, isolated Joe, alone Joe, and maybe someone walks in the room and for just that magic second moment, you know, there's that eye contact and something that we don't really understand happens and, and Joe thinks maybe she's the one. You know, maybe we have something that could go further. Um, and everything that derives after that in the book is based on that. You know, a woman he's never met, doesn't know anything about, only the one meeting. Uh, the first scene is an Elvis Cole scene, and it speaks to their friendship and the things that are to come in the book. I'll set the stage for you. It's, it's the middle of the night. <clears throat> Elvis is at home in his A-frame in the Hollywood Hills. Huge windstorm in L.A. like we not... Uh, long ago recently had and uh, but it isn't the noise from the wind that wakes him it's a nightmare that he has <clears throat> the wind did not wake him it was the dream he heard the buffeting wind before he opened his eyes but the dream was what woke him on that dark early morning a cat was his witness Hunkered at the end of the bed, ears down, a low growl in his chest, a ragged black cat was staring at him when Elvis Cole opened his eyes. Its warrior face was angry. And in that moment, Cole knew they had shared the nightmare. Cole woke on the bed in his loft, bathed in soft moonlight, feeling his A-frame shudder as the wind tried to push it from its perch high in the Hollywood Hills. He sat up awake now and wanting to shake off the dream. An ugly nightmare. 
that left him feeling unsettled and depressed. The cat's ears stayed down. Cole held out his hand, but the cat poured off the bed like a pool of black ink. Cole said, yeah, yeah, me too. He checked the time. Have it. 3.12 in the a.m. He reached toward the nightstand to check his gun. Have it. But dropped himself when he realized what he was doing. Come on, what's the point? The gun was there because it was always there. Sometimes needed, but most times not. Living alone with only an angry cat for company, <coughs> there seemed no reason to move it. Now, at 3.12 in the middle of a wind-torched night, it was a reminder of what he had lost. Cole realized he was trembling and pushed out of bed. The dream scared him. <clears throat> Muzzle flashed so bright it sparkled his eyes. The charcoal smell of smokeless powder glittery red mist that dappled his skin, shattered sunglasses that arced through the air, images so vivid they shocked him awake. Now he shook as his body burned off the fear. The back of Cole's house was an A-shaped glass steeple, giving him a view of the canyon behind his house and a diamond dust glimpse of the city beyond. Now, the canyon was blue with bright moonlight. The sleeping houses below were surrounded by blue and gray trees that danced in the St. Vitus wind. Cole wondered if someone down there had awakened like him. He wondered if they had suffered a similar nightmare, seeing their best friend shot to death in the dark. Violence was part of them. Elvis Cole did not want it, seek it, or enjoy it, but maybe these were only things he told himself in cold moments like now. The nature of his life had cost him the woman he loved, and the little boy he had grown to love and left him alone in this house with nothing but an angry cat for company and a pistol that did not need to be put away. Now here was this dream that left his skin crawling. So real it felt like a premonition. He looked at the phone and told himself, no, nah, no, come on, it's silly, it's stupid, it's three in the morning. Cole made the call. One ring and his call was answered at three in the morning. Pike. Hey, man. Cole didn't know what to say after that feeling so stupid. You okay? <coughs> Pike said, Good. You? Yeah, I'm sorry, man. I know it's late. You okay? Yeah, I just had a bad feeling is all. They lapsed into a silence Cole found embarrassing, but it was Pike who spoke first. You need me, I'm there. It's this wind. This wind is crazy, man. Uh-huh. Listen, watch yourself, okay? He told Pike he would call again soon and put down the phone. Cole felt no relief after the call. He told himself he should, but he did not. The dream should have faded, but it did not. Talking to Pike now made it feel even more real. You need me. I'm there. How many times had Joe Pike placed himself in harm's way to save him? <clears throat> they had fought the good fight together and won, and sometimes lost. They had shot people who had been harmed or were doing harm and been shot, and Joe Pike had saved Cole's life more than a few times like an archangel from heaven. Yet here was the dream, and the dream did not fade. Muzzle flashes in a dingy room. A woman's shadow cast on the wall, dark glasses spinning into space, Joe Pike falling through a terrible red mist. Cole <coughs> crept downstairs through the dark house and stepped down onto his deck. Leaves and debris stung his face like sand on a windswept beach. Lights from the houses below glittered like fallen stars. In low moments on nights like this, when Elvis Cole thought of the woman and the boy, he told himself the violence in his life had cost him everything. But he knew that was not true. As lonely as he sometimes felt, he still had more to lose. He could lose his best friend. That's Elvis's dream. Now, <clears throat> the story starts a few days later. It starts in a very banal, happenstance kind of way. 
Uh, you know, even Joe Pike has to buy gas. And one morning, uh, he's at a gas station tanking up the Jeep. And while he's waiting for the, uh, for the, for the gas thing to ding, uh, he looks across the street and, and he sees two obvious gangbangers rolling down the sidewalk. You know, they're all inked up. And, and, and Joe was a cop for three years, you guys know that. And, you know, then he's been Joe for forever. And, and, and he's and all his experiences with Elvis and crime and criminals. So he's getting that vibe. These guys are up to something, you know. He knows they are trouble on the hoof. And when he sees them going to the door in the small mom and pop sandwich shop across the street, he just is concerned that they're gonna do something that ain't so great. So <clears throat> rather than walk away, uh, what he does is trot across the street and look in the door just to see, just to be sure. And lo, lo and behold, his radar was correct because these two guys, they have the the older gentleman who, who owns the place, uh, you know, makes the sandwiches. They have them on the floor, and they're beating the hell out of them. They're kicking them bloody. And Joe being Joe, he steps in. Um, he puts down one of the bad guys, breaking his arm in the process. The other guy gets away, and then Joe has to do first aid on the, uh, the gentleman who's, who's uh, the sandwich maker there. Um, calls 911, paramedics and the cops come out. Uh, the, um, and they kind of get the backstory. You know, this, this old guy is getting beat up. His name is Wilson Smith. He's uh, a Katrina survivor, an expatriate from Louisiana, moved out after the storm. And now in Venice, uh, California, up there, he's got a little po'boy shop. He's trying to make a go of that. Um, but he's in bad shape. And uh, what the story tells is that these guys came in looking for a po'boy, and, and he didn't want to make it for whatever reason. And they got into an argument. The argument escalated into a fight, and that's how all this happened. Well, <clears throat> while, uh, while we're getting that backstory and while the paramedics are trying to get these guys strapped up so they can take them to the hospital, the following happens. The paramedics were lifting Wilson Smith onto the gurney when Pike saw her enter through the rear door. She hadn't seen the ambulances and police vehicles out front, and now the uniforms crowding the small room stopped her as if she had slammed into a wall. Pike watched her eyes snap from the paramedics to the gurney to the police. Snap, snap, snap. Sucking up the scene until snap. Her eyes came to him, and that's where they stayed. Pike guessed she was in her 30s with olive skin and lines around her eyes. She had smart eyes, and the lines made them better. She wore a sleeveless linen dress, flat sandals, and short, dark hair. The dress was wrinkled. Pike liked smart eyes. Then officers Heideck and McIntosh turned, and her eyes left him for them. Smith shifted to see her past the paramedics. <clears throat> That's Drew. She's my niece. Her name was Drew Rain, and she moved between Smith and the police as they told her what happened. You were assaulted right here? Wait, right here in the shop. They attacked you. I was doing okay. Then this guy here stopped it. <laughs> Drew Rain studied Pike again, and this time she mouthed two words, as if the officers and paramedics and her uncle could not see or were not there, <coughs> creating a moment between the two of them that included no one else. She said, thank you. Pike nodded one time. Then she turned to the paramedics. Is my uncle going to be all right? Well, we're going to keep him for observation. With head injuries like this, they like to keep them overnight. The paramedics finished strapping Smith to the cart, and Pike watched her follow them out. She did not look at Pike as she left. Officer Heideck waited until they were gone, then turned back to Pike. She still held his driver's license. So you think what happened here was a dispute over a sandwich? Pike shook his head, and Heideck glanced at his license again considering it. You look familiar. Do I know you? No. Those tattoos ring a bell. A bright red arrow was inked onto the outside of each of Pike's deltoids. They pointed forward. Pike was six feet one, weighed just over 200 pounds, and his arms were ropey with muscle. His hair was a quarter inch short. His skin was cooked dark, and his knuckles were scarred and coarse. 
Heideck thumbed the edge of his license, staring at him. Most people walk into a beat down like this, they run. We're looking at you. I guess you can handle yourself. What do you do, Mr. Pike? Businessman. <laughs> of course. If she noticed a bulge where one of the two pistols he carried was hidden, she ignored it. Well, I guess Mr. Smith is lucky it was you who happened by. She gave him a business card along with his license when she returned it. Okay, the detectives are going to want to talk to you, but this is my card. If you think of anything in the meantime, why don't you give me a call? Pike took the card. Heideck left to join McIntosh at the radio car. Drew Rain was with her uncle as the paramedics <coughs> slid the gurney into their truck. Heideck and McIntosh climbed into their car, flipped on their lights, and stopped traffic to let the ambulance leave. The paramedics headed toward the hospital. Heideck and McIntosh turned in the opposite direction, already rolling to another call. Drew Rain watched the ambulance, ambulance until the ambulance was gone, then turned back to the shop. Pike didn't like the way she hurried. It was like she was running for cover. Pike, masked by the shadows and still as a rock in the corner of the shop, said, Why is he lying? She startled, making a little jump. Oh my God, you scared me. Pike nodded, then realized he should probably apologize. Sorry. She gave, him, she gave him a grateful smile, then went behind the counter. Oh no, you don't have to be sorry, I'm jumpy. I have to get to the hospital. Why is he lying? Well, why do you think? He's scared they'll come back. They've been here before. She turned off the deep fryers and put lids on metal condiment containers speaking as she worked. They live here. We live here. So we have to think about these things. People like that, they always come back. If you think they'll come back, you should tell the police. Heidi knows what she's doing. She cocked her head. I thought you were the police. No. You look like a policeman, kind of. Just passing by. She smiled again and offered her hand across the counter. Drew Rain. You can call me Drew. Joe Pike. Then that was extra nice, what you did helping like that, Mr. Pike. Thank you. They shook. Then Drew Rain turned back to her work. Listen, I, I don't want to be rude or anything, but I have to get this place locked up so I can go to the hospital. Pike nodded, thinking there was no reason he shouldn't leave. But he did not. He clocked her hand. No wedding ring. Talk to the police. You'll <coughs> be fine. You don't know my uncle. He probably called him names and made it worse. She stacked the metal containers, then carried the stack into the back room. When she disappeared, Pike wrote his name and cell number on an order pad. He wrote his personal cell number, not the business number he gave the police. I'm leaving my number. If you need me, call. She was still in the back. Okay, thank you. Pike returned to his Jeep, but he did not leave the scene. He waited at the far end of the alley until a few minutes later, Drew Rain came out, locked the door, and hurried to a silver tercel. It was an older model with paint scraped from the rear bumper. Pike thought she looked worried. He sat in the Jeep until she was gone, then got out and walked the length of the block. He took in the people on the sidewalks and in the stores and the roof lines of the surrounding buildings. He studied the people behind the wheels of the passing cars, thinking about what she had said. They always come back. Pike was across from the gas station when a maroon Monte Carlo slow rolled past with the windows down. Two young men were in front, with a third in back, all three showing gang ink and jailhouse faces. They stared at Pike as they passed, so Pike stared back. The man in the back seat made a gun of his hand, aimed, and pulled the trigger. Pike watched them go, thinking how Drew Rain had run for cover. They always come back.
No, Pike thought. Not if they fear you. And that's when Pike meets Drew Rain. If you want to see what happens after you have to read. <laughs> <coughs> okay. Um, now it's your turn. Q&A? My voice needs a restless. One of you has to talk. <laughs> yes, sir. So I turned my brother on to you and Harlan Coben, yep. and he has a two-and-a-half-year-old named Elvis, but he was almost Myron. And uh, I said, Myron gets his butt kicked, and Elvis doesn't. Name him Elvis, please. Good choice. Yes. Yes. So uh, I saw Harlan and Coben and who he reads. Who do you read? Who do you look forward to coming out? I'm stuck in the genre, and if somebody hands me something else, I can't even read it. I have to wait till there's about six of you out there that I just, I'm dying for you to. Thank you so much. Um, well, let's see. I, I, you know what? I'm not gonna, there aren't going to be any secrets here. There's a local writer that I think is underplayed enormously, who I think is brilliant. This guy named Don Winslow. Yeah. Yeah. And if you don't read him, uh, pick Don's work up. He is spectacular. There's also, um, you may not have heard of this guy, there's a South African writer who's the last, only the last, he writes in Afrikaans, and he's translated. <clears throat> and only the last few years have his books been available here in the U.S. I don't know if you guys have, his name is uh, Dayon Meyer. D-E-O-N-M-E-Y-E-R. Uh, they're crime thrillers, but they're set in, in, in Africa. Uh, and they're rich with, with the feel of, of Africa. And I would recommend him, too. But you read those guys only after you read me. <laughs> <laughs> Another question. Another question. Yes, sir. I just, uh, last August, started working from home. And up until that time, I used to think what an easy gig you guys have. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting around your house, getting up when you want, write a book, write when you want. Yeah. It's been hard for me. I wonder what it is like in your life when you have to get up and, and kick yourself out of bed, perhaps, like I do, and actually go to work. Yeah. And then the second question is, and I'll be done, is that when I read books, I like to kind of put a face with the character. I wonder who, if you had a, if they were to make a movie, and I don't know why they haven't, mm -hmm. with Elvis and Joe, who do you see playing the parts of these two guys? If you, if you didn't hear, he asked two questions. One, kind of what my day is like. In other words, what's it like for me? <laughs> and, and, and then uh, the other is, is about the, if I see anyone for as Elvis and Joe and about the movie thing. I'll answer the second one first. Uh, there's not, I don't sell a film rights to Elvis and Joe. I do my standalone books and have, uh, but I just don't want there to be a film um, of Elvis and Joe for a variety of, of, of reasons. As, as for, <clears throat> and I, the, consequently, um, I, I, I just don't think in terms of casting them, so I don't have actors who I think look like them. And then <laughs> under the heading of, of weird psychology, uh, even though I've been writing these things since 1987, I have never once in all that time seen Elvis or Joe's face. I could not tell you what they actually look like. Mm -hmm. I only see this sort of gray, fuzzy... Sh I mean, I, here's what's weird. I find this weird. Is there a psychologist here to explain this? I see them quite clearly at ground level, meaning I can tell you exactly what their shoes look like. <laughs> but as I rise up, as that camera rises from the floor straight up, panning up, up the body, it gets grayer and grayer more shadowy. And by the time we get here, I can kind of see the outline sharply and clearly, like a silhouette, but I see absolutely no features. And I've never had. Wow. Yeah, and I I don't know why that is, but I, I think it's worth a doctoral thesis. <laughs> <laughs> Something. Um, uh, and my day, yeah, you know what? The um, Robert Parker once said, and I agree completely, um, and I saw this when I was a very young writer, he said the uh, the tough part of this job is putting your butt in your chair. Uh, and, and it is. It requires an enormous amount of discipline, um, I found, to, to do this. And uh, because there's, you know, there's so many better things to do. <laughs> you know, I mean, like taking out the trash is more fun. Um, but I, after all this time, I'm, I'm extremely disciplined. It's, if, I have, if, if there's one good thing to say about me, I, I, I think I'm, I'm very rigid and disciplined. And I'm there every day. I have a set pattern. I do that same thing every day of my life. It is probably boring. You know, I get up, I exercise early. I get up really early because I'm freakish. 
and then I exercise and the exercise out of the way, and then I work. And I'm, by 7 a.m. or so, I'm there at my computer, and, and I just do it every day, and I, and I block out everything else. I don't know any other way to do it. Uh, I don't wait for inspiration. Uh, you hear that a lot from writers. You hear another thing, oh, the book wrote myself. I've never had a book write itself. My characters take off and tell me the story. That's never happened. Uh, they, they talk to me, not while I'm on my meds. <laughs> so it's, it's just work, you know. You work it every day and you rewrite and revise and, and it's done. Another question? Anyone? Yes, sir. How did you get Steven Seagal to, to pose for your publicity photo? <laughs> Which one? The one on the, on the poster. Oh, the, that's, the, that's Steven Seagal? Looks like Steven Seagal. Oh, I thought it was Gene Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> Another question. <laughs> well, what are we going to do with that? <laughs> yes. Um, Elvis Cole, when he's going around doing his investigating, goes to all kinds of wonderful little dives and restaurants and things. Yeah. Are those real or do you make them up? And if they're real, you should do a book on L.A. restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? They, uh, they're a mix of real and made up. Um, I use real places in, in, in my books. And, I, and, of course, it's fun to research restaurants. In the, I'll tell you, here's a, a, a thing that I did. It was great fun for me. There's a, uh, another terrific, in, in L.A., there's a terrific uh, general independent bookstore called Small World Books. Which is in most of this book is set in Venice, uh, you know, up there by the by Marina del Rey, and right there on the Venice boardwalk. And if you've never been there, it doesn't matter because on TV you've seen it because that's where all the goofy people are, and you know, and, and, and women in bikinis and roller skates, and you know, all that crap they show on TV. Venice boardwalk. Uh, there's a great bookstore there called Small World Books, and right next door to Small World Books, <clears throat> there's a, a a cafe on the boardwalk called Sidewalk Cafe. So a couple of years ago, or a year ago, whatever it was, I found out, a friend of mine called me and he said, hey, I was at the Sidewalk Cafe by Small World, World Books. You know, there's a pizza there named after you. <laughs> and I said, are you kidding me? And I thought it was, born, you know, because I get lied to all the time. But I, then I did a little research and lo and behold. So because it's next to this bookstore, this restaurant, what they do is a lot of their, their dishes they name after writers. There's like the, you know, the Hemingway and the this and the that, the ball sack and yeah, me. Um, and then I was so tickled by that, I used them in this book. So there's a scene in this book that takes place, a couple of scenes actually, that takes place at the uh, Sidewalk Cafe, which is a real place. Um, but no one eats the Robert Crace pizza because I thought that would be over the line. <laughs> but a lot of the restaurants I mentioned are, are real. What's on that pizza? What is that pizza? That pizza is all meat. <laughs> signings, right? <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. In your next book, it's so hard to wait for the next one, and I'm oh, personally glad you're not you. ever going to hopefully sell the movie, or sell the movies. Is Elvis in the main character? Yes, the, the next season? book is an Elvis Cole book. He's the main character. After two Joes in a row, Elvis was whispering and saying, hey man, don't leave me behind. <laughs> and, uh, I'm the guy who made you. <laughs> so, yeah, he's it, Elvis is back. Now, Joe's in it, and Joe's in it, is it a, right now in the writing, and I still have a lot of writing to do. Right now it's looking like 60% Elvis, 40% Joe, so Joe has a huge role. But it's uh, it's mostly Elvis. It's primarily his story, <clears throat> and it's it's... <laughs> just, just saying. <laughs> Another question. Yes, sir. Yes. Have you responded to Lee Child's joke about the Jack Reacher? No. What's what's his joke? Well, uh, basically, they were interviewing and someone asked the question: oh. If Joe Pike and Jack Reacher got in a fight, what would happen? Oh. And his response was, of course, for his character. I wonder if you heard that. No, no, I, I, I know what you're trying to do. I, uh, well, here's my response, uh, which I've said now 842 times. Uh, if, 
See, I don't think Joe and Jack would ever fight. I think, because I come up with really good ideas, I think that if Joe and Jack ever found themselves in a situation where they were supposed to square off and fight, they're both smart enough that they would realize someone had set them up. And at that point, they would join forces <laughs> and track down the guy who'd set him up and kick his ass. <laughs> now, wouldn't that be a good novel? Yeah. Yeah. Of course it would, because I thought of the idea. No, that's a surrogate. Another question. Was there no, uh, yes, ma'am, then I'll come back here. Um, is Starkey going to be in the next one? You know, <clears throat> I don't know yet if Starkey is going to be in the next one. Um, Lucy Chenier is coming back in the next one. Um, but, it's funny you ask about Starkey. What did, what did you, did you groan? I don't she like said Lucy. She said she like uh, I, I get that all the time. Uh, one of my funniest stories ever occurred in this bookstore, but I'll get there in a second. Um, I used to think, you know, Starkey, of course, is, is part of the Elvis Cole um, series now. And I wrote Demolition Angel. And I never intended, of course, to write, and I sold the film rights uh, to Demolition Angel. Well, I don't know, they're not doing anything. They paid me, but uh, yeah, that's the good part. I, I got their money. Uh, but I never intended to write Carol Stargate or, or give her her own book again. I just love this whole thing I'm doing with her in the book, in the, in the Elvis books. But this past year while I was finishing up the century, I got a, an idea I really like. Now, it's not going to be one of my front burner projects, but I think she's going to have her own book again. Uh, you know, I, I've changed, you know, she went from where she was in, uh, in Demolition Angel, she, had, she was recovered bomb tech, was working for CCS, and then she worked for uh, 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 Hollywood Juvenile in, um, in The Last Detective, that's where I brought her into Elvis series, and then uh, in Chasing Darkness, she had, had moved from <laughs> Juvenile Division into Hollywood Homicide, which is where she now resides. And, and I got an idea that I like a lot, and I think, um, I think maybe there's going to be a book for her in the, uh, in the works. But whether or not she shows up, that, that has nothing to do with whether or not she shows up in the book I'm writing now. She will not, I don't think, have a major role. But Lucy's going to be there, and it looks like she's going to have a major role. Yeah. Oh, so the funny story about this woman over here who hates Lucy. Uh, I don't hate her, I just you, don't like her. I was doing a signing here. I don't know if you'll remember this. This was at your store here. And this is a bunch of years ago. And so we get to the Q&A part, like we did tonight. And for some reason, I think the orientation was different. I think I was behind there, and everyone was facing this way. Um, and the, so the, as soon as I say Q&A part, this woman was sitting on, on that side. It's like... <laughs> you know, so I called on her. She was first up. She stands up, and she says, "I came all the way from Hawaii to tell you something. <laughs> Kill Lucy." <laughs> <laughs> what was really funny is that when she did that, when she said, "Kill Lucy," there was a woman sitting on this side who jumped up and said, "No!" <laughs> Did I miss one? Somebody? There was a. Uh, oh, over here. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, um, I just wondered if the, you'll ever get to play poker with Richard Castle, Michael Conley, and James Patterson. You know, I <clears throat> they've not asked, uh, so I don't. I think they're scared. I'm gonna take their money. <laughs> you know, I don't know. That'd be a hoot, but I don't even know if they're gonna continue that game. You know, because Steve Cannell was yeah, part of that game, and I've heard that maybe they've decided not to. Uh, but that's not like hard news. That's just the whole rumor thing. That Check Facebook. Hmm? Check <laughs> Facebook. All the truth is on Facebook. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna take a couple more before I sign. Uh, or, yes, sir. Can you tell us about your acting credentials? <laughs> I have zero acting credentials. You I'm not an actor. Performed in any no. TV or no. movies? Never TV. Never that's movies. Very never movie theater. Yeah. No. Don't act. Too shy. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> when you finish with a project, are you able to fully move on to the new next project that you're doing? Or so, for example, when you're reading tonight, are you reading it and thinking, "Oh, gosh, you know, I would have liked to have changed this dialogue in here," or do you completely move on to the next thing? Um, a good question. Because no, I'm horrible about that, and I'm not good. I don't. Uh, all of you know my books way better than me uh, because you've read them more recently. I don't reread my work, 
and the reason I don't uh, is because every time I reread it, like if I go back, to I want to rewrite it. And in fact, when I'm when a book is actually in process, like 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 the, the century or any of them, the process for me is, <clears throat> and this is bad for a writer. I'm the first one to admit it, and I try to control it. I'm like a drug addict, and, and you know you're always a drug addict, but you're just sober, and and you you day at a time. I'm like that with rewrites. Um, I know that there has to be a place where you say it is good enough. And then you move on, meaning you have to turn it in at some point. Otherwise, you just write forever and you never turn anything in. So you say, okay, it's now good enough. And you turn it in. And you begin the whole process toward publication, which is there are many, many steps to get there to actually make this thing. Uh, and I rewrite and revise constantly through all that. And it drives my editors crazy. It has always driven them crazy. And I will continue to potchkey and mess with it and, and, and refine it until literally my editor says, Chris, you got something Thursday, we're printing it. And that's actually when it's over for me, because I know I can't change it. But if I go back to rewrite it, um, I, I mean, to, to reread it, I literally say, oh, Jesus, I could have made that line so much better. Or if only this word were different. And that's an illness that no writer should have to endure. Yeah, it's not a, not a good thing. Uh, yes, sir. I didn't know about your Hill Street Blues and all of that great stuff because I loved all of those. Yeah. Are you writing anything else for TV? No, I don't write anything to do with TV or movies. No, no more? Writer. No. I have no interest. Don't miss it. Um, it was. I consider all that period my school. I was a baby writer. I mean, I, it, when I was doing all that stuff, I was literally, I was the, I was the youngest story at Universal at the time when I worked under contract at Universal. I, I did all this stuff. It was like a trivial pers pursuit question for 80s TV, you know, all that cop show stuff. Uh, the good fortune for me is that I was blessed with working with some of the best writers and producers in the business. You know, when you're talking Stephen Bochco and Adam crew and, and all those different people, Tony Yerkovich and, and, and Ed Waters and all these different people that I, I worked with, for a young, um, growing writer, and on those shows in particular which stressed characterization, which stressed dialogue, which, you know, those were the strengths of those shows. Uh, oft times elaborate plots and, and uh, uh, enormous attention was paid to the detail of drama uh, as opposed to, you know, like, just shoot them up crap. Uh, a, a benefit that I cannot overestimate. Uh, and now, <clears throat> you know, I want to write books. That's what I want to do. I don't want to write anything else. But I think those lessons that I learned when I was a baby writer, I've brought to my books since the beginning. Uh, at least I, I like to think that, that I have, and I think that that's a positive impact on what I did. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, she asked, oh, again, okay, so you, you know about the, yeah, okay. Um, she asked if Harry, uh, if Elvis and Harry Bosch are going to cross paths again. No, me, again, if you don't know, uh, <clears throat> several books ago, Mike and, uh, Mike and I are friends, and we had Elvis and Joe do a little cross-pollination. Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, Elvis and, and, and Harry Bosch. Uh, in Mike's book, uh, Lost Light, there's a, an unnamed encounter between Harry and, and, and Elvis, because you know they live basically in the same neighborhood. Not really, but on the same mountain, <laughs> just on different, different sides. <coughs> and Mike had them pass each other, kind of waving it. And then in my book, uh, uh, the Forgotten Man, I think it was. Uh, I think it was The Forgotten Man. See, I forget. But uh, <laughs> there, there's a scene, again, unnamed. You won't find the name Harry Bosch, but anyone who knows Harry knows that was Harry. No, so she asked, is that going to happen again? Um, and no, I don't think so, because Mike and I have done it. You know, we did it for fun. By the way, when we did it, we didn't tell anyone. We had been talking about it for like two or three years. You know, we should really do something like this. and. But just just for us, and, and it took us a while to figure out how we wanted to do it. Uh, but then when we did, we didn't tell anyone. Not even we just did it. And if people noticed, then they would notice. And if they didn't notice, then they wouldn't notice. And it turned out everybody noticed. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's the way. Yes, ma'am. Um, when you talk about being a scriptwriter, is that? Did you always want to be a writer of books, or why did you start out at this, and how did you start out doing scripts? And then, it yeah. sounds like you've always wanted to be a book writer. Yeah, I always wanted to. Well, I always wanted to write, 
I've been writing some, one thing or another since I was in junior high, seventh, eighth grade. Uh, and earlier in my in my my life, I just wanted to write everything. It didn't matter what, whether it was you know books, TV, short stories, magazine articles, journalistic pieces, nonfiction, uh, you know, I, whatever. I just wanted to write. I wanted to get paid for typing, <coughs> and um, and managed to do most of it. But then over time, um, like I, I, when I came out here, I didn't really think I would work full time in TV ever. I just thought it would be cool to write some scripts and, and, and make some money at it, but also then write other things. But it kind of took over my life because it was fun. You know, it was, it was great fun for me. I mean, you know, one day I'm swatting mosquitoes on the bayou, and the next <laughs> I'm on sound stages at Universal. It was kind of neat and cool. But um, pretty quickly, I just wanted to go back to prose, and I wanted to, to create my own characters and write novels because, for me, novels are the ultimate playground. I have the freedom to do whatever I want. I don't have to ask executives or producers or or whoever and get their rubber stamp before I write it. I just get to do it. But it sounds like such a torturous process for you. Mm. you well, must love it's, it. Are you going to be I love it. It, 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 it. I think I'll, I need to put myself through hell. It's just you know my dementia. It's just it's just I don't know. I, I'm that way. But I'm I'm certifiably unemployable at anything else. <laughs> so I have to do I have to do this and, and do this. Well, you do it very well. Thank you very much. Uh, anything else? Uh, Going once, one again. Yes, sir. Um, my kids decided I needed a Kindle for Christmas. Yeah. I have a attachment by books. Every time I finish a book I sign it. It goes in my library. Right. My house is filled with books. Filled with books. Good house. Uh, so, yes, sir. But how does that? How does that? Uh, what's your reaction to this whole change to that kind of? Uh, <laughs> remember, remember the guy I read? Two books. Two books. Two books. <laughs> a good reader. <laughs> um, Can you sign the Kindle? Well, see, that's actually a, uh, that's actually a problem. Uh, but I mean, it, listen, it's the failing of the Kindle. That I've, I've heard that joke many, many times. Uh, because what do you sign with? Marks a lot, and then you can't read it. Uh, uh, but seriously, I. We were talking about this at dinner. The the ebooks are here. Now I'm a book guy, like you. My house is filled with books. I like books, uh, but you know my daughter she has a Kindle, and 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 my wife has an iPad which she may or may not read on, but but she wanted one and she's given it a try. I don't want to read on those things, but you know I, I like books. Uh, nevertheless, the the. E-books are here, Kindles and all that stuff are here. Uh, every publisher in New York, <coughs> I mean, publishers make books for a living. They all use Kindles to read manuscripts on them because it's easier to carry around your Kindle. You can have five manuscripts as opposed to five times four, 2,000 pages of, sure. of manuscripts. So they, it, it, it's here. Ultimately, um, it, it's not about the delivery system. For me, it's about it's about the story. Um, I think what's really going to happen, though, in the in the near to midterm, is is a sort of a of a mashup of both books. And, like I don't think I don't think Kindles are going to make bookstores like this go away. Uh, yeah, I hope not too, uh, because for a variety of reasons. But I don't. I sincerely don't think they will. I think what's going to happen is you're going to see a lot of overplay. Um, Certainly in the near term, you're going to see people buying both. Does it change the financial landscape for a, for a writer? You know, uh, that's still being sorted out and worked out. I mean, I uh, this is the first of my books <coughs> where the e-book, this is how new it all is. The e-book is offered simultaneously with, with the hardcover. So I'm out there right now selling e-books along with selling these. Um, so we don't know. You know, ask me in a year, and I can tell you. Uh, ask my publisher in a year. But but it, it's all still the, the, the open doorway in the in the frontier. Um, I think it's going to sort out. Remember, ebooks cost nothing to produce. So what you're really talking about is defining a business model, uh, and and how you define the business model is going to determine how you interpret the profit. You know, they they pay what they pay for for books like this based on selling books like this. And if your business model is based on selling books like this, then all the money you make from ebooks is found money. It's like walking out of your front yard on a bag with cash in it. Because uh, it costs nothing to produce. The cost all went into this thing. Uh, 
Um, I don't actually think in the, in the near to midterm it's going to cause any kind of dramatic change or shift at all. I think it's just going to cause a lot of talk in articles, which is what's happening. My husband's when, a computer programmer. He's yeah. going to create an app tomorrow. We're going to call it the Crace app. And what will this app <laughs> and do? And that app is going to be sent to you, and you're going to be able to autograph it, and people can pay to have that autograph go with their e-book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying here. <laughs> How much do I get? Oh, you get, you get a real royalty on it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You get all the royalty. Oh, good. I like that. I want it all. <laughs> okay, anything else? One more? Going once, going twice. Yes, ma'am. How about audiobooks? Audiobooks. I love audiobooks. Mm -hmm. I don't listen to audiobooks either. But, 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 I, but audiobooks has a very defined market. Audiobooks are listened to by mostly mostly two types of people commuters and people who are working out and that's who you know in other words people who are busy with their hands and their attention has to be somewhere else typically commuters and then people who are like on treadmills you know or bicycles or jogging or, or whatever now again not everyone you'll find people who, but i i love i have a great relationship i sell a lot of audio books like a lot even like to read for them you know i've recorded a couple of my books in audio but that's all. That's just a, an entirely different, an entirely different market that I think is here to stay forever. Right. Okay. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate. It.